Okay, so um, we're going to start with Refuge and Bodhicitta again. So if you want to just take a minute and reconnect. Sangi chudon sogi chunam la janchu badu dani kapsu chi dagi chun yen ki pe sonam ki rola penche sangi rupa sho sangi chudon sogi chunam la janchu badu dani kapsu chi dagi jen sogi pe sonam ki Rola pinche sangi drupa sho sangi chudon sogi chunam la jancho baru dani gapsu chi dagi janyangi pe sonam gi rola pinche sangi drupa sho. But we'll just start with if there's any questions or ideas that came up. So how is it all sitting? Hi, Venerable. Hey. Hey. Could you give a specific example of how to bring the mindful of bodhicitta to everyday life? Yeah, yeah. Bodhicitta mindfulness is a, it's a really powerful practice. It's, um, I mean, the, the simple explanation is basically your, you, your, setting your motivation with bodhicitta and then being mindful. And so you're mindful with an agenda to check, am I staying with bodhicitta or not? You know, has my motivation slipped? Are my activities in alignment or what? So that's like the basic idea is that it's normal mindfulness, but it's mindfulness with a very proactive bodhicitta motivation, which is a lot more powerful than um, regular mindfulness, which is good and helps you relax, helps you stay focused, but it doesn't accumulate as much merit and it can be very easily about stress relief for this day rather than a continuous practice for this life, lifetimes all the way to enlightenment. So bodhicitta mindfulness is really upgrading your mindfulness. And so um, Lama Zopa Rinpoche wrote a book called uh, Bodhicitta Attitude, which talks about bodhicitta mindfulness a lot. But basically, the way to kind of get yourself into it is to choose a few activities in the day that you do all the time and try to marry those up with a bodhicitta motivation really consciously like a project. So every time you open and close a door or turn on and off a light or put your shoes on, put your shoes off, something that you do a lot, um, just take that as kind of opportunities to reinvigorate your bodhicitta. You know, so it's something tangible and physical and repetitive that you do anyway. And then you're consciously using those as ways to recalibrate. Because to say, have mindfulness all day, have bodhicitta all, every, all day is great. But I mean, we're not that focused, are we? We get distracted. So we have, you know, a few good minutes and then we're like, Ooh, what's that? <laughs> so if we can have organized chapters or organized activities where we key back into our practice, it's going to be really useful. Um, you know, one I use a lot when I'm in Australia is the car, right? Anytime I um, get in the car, I take a minute and I set my motivation and I just sit for like one minute, not even long. And then when I um, park, I sit for one minute and revive my motivation before I get out of the car. So I try to always use the car and then uh, doors, shoes, you know, toilet, <laughs> etc. Yeah. Was there a, a raised hand? Somebody's name is in Hebrew. Yeah, was there a question? No, I wanted to say that um, I think that the COVID-19 is, it, it showed us that we can be more mindful because suddenly there are all these new instructions about washing your hands and being mindful when you go outside the street. And it's, it's actually, I mean, it's kind of incredible to see the entire world adapting to a new set of rules. So I was trying to, to incorporate this new mindfulness instructions into what I'm already trying to practice. And it just shows you that we are very adaptive and we can incorporate these things into our daily life. So if we can just treat I don't know, our own karmic imprints, the same as COVID-19, it would be really beneficial all around. 
Yeah, it's a, that's a really good point. Because, and why are we mindful? Because we don't want the result, right? We're mindful so we wear our mask because we don't want to get sick or make anyone else sick. So we're mindful because we don't want the negative result. It's true, because we're aware of it, then we're careful. It's like we somehow need to get into our heads that it's worth our while to be careful with our body, speech, and mind, right? It's worth our while to be um, aware of our karma and to be aware of, you know, what it is we're getting up to. It's, it's worth our time, isn't it? Yeah, you, so you could use some bodhicitta mindfulness with your mask, you know, put it on. May I only say kind things <laughs> or may I refrain from divisive speech? <laughs> it could be your new one, right? Hand sanitizer. May I purify all the negativities that came before this moment. Oh, I'm about to say, I'm about to say, you know, each time. Right? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's doable, isn't it? We just have to make it important enough for us to wake up to it. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, start really small, you know, start with a couple things that you do anyway. Um, you know, every time you sit down to your computer screen or every time you pick up your phone or something that's just, you know, a physical reminder to come back into the present and to have that agenda of bodhicitta, just, you know, because then it'll last, you know, for, you know, a few minutes, a few hours, whatever, and then you have to refresh it, you know, like refreshing the browser on your computer. Just keep it refreshed. It's how you already want to be. It's just, we forget, you know? Um, I also wanted to ask about the text. Hmm. I, mean, I, know that it's, uh, I know that it's metaphorical that we can be either crows or peacocks, but I mean, the point is that we are crows right now, but we can become a peacock eventually, right? Yep. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's like the first part of the text is to kind of both kind of worry you in a healthy way and inspire you. So it's kind of like, here's the state of affairs. There are people that use the environment for their path and there are people that don't. Where are you? Uh, okay, so what do you think? And then it goes on to talk about karma specifically. So from verse um, 10 onward, or most, uh, most of the way onward is kind of specific karmic results for us to kind of go, oh, right, be the bodhisattva be the peacock. So it's kind of like setting the scene, you know, setting the premise, it's the prelude to the play, kind of, you know, here are the players and here's the dynamic and here's the look of the whole thing. Let's just kind of get into this atmosphere of what could we be doing with our life? How could we be living our life in a way that um, is enriched by hardship? Let's, let's really sit with that as a premise. And then do we like this premise? Do we want to get on board with this premise? And then here's some more reasons why it's in your own best interest. And then here's some more reasons how you can use it for your work to benefit others. So yeah, it's like setting the scene and saying basically by even noticing that you're a crow, you're coming closer to being a bodhisattva. By even identifying the fact that there are bodhisattvas makes it easier for you to meet them there. You know, it's just a gradual process. So, so let, it, let it uplift you and inspire you to see that such things are possible, not deflate you by the fact that you're not there yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is the thing we come back to in Buddhism again and again, that if you think amazing people are a separate species, it's problematic for your path, right? If you think of His Holiness the Dalai Lama as being a completely different everything you, then you can never achieve his state. But if you think of him as the continuation and the progression of what you've already started, then you can meet him there someday. You know, it, it seems like it's being humble to say, amazing magic people, me down here, I'm crap. You know, and we're totally separate and I could never be, you know, Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King or whoever, you know but to realize that they are the result of practice and repetitive internal thoughts that they've had with themselves and challenges that they've brought into their path have been the very thing that has made them amazing. You know, that these people that we look up to, if they hadn't had hardship, they also wouldn't be as amazing. So the, our hardships similarly are good news in this sense. It's workable, you know, so something to look up to, you know. So <clears throat> the first time I ever heard this teaching um, 
was when I was a lay person and I was probably six days from becoming ordained. Okay, so the first time I heard this teaching, I've been living at Chen Rezig Institute in Australia for a couple of years on and off. And um, I knew I was going to be a nun and the date was set and we had a, you know, a semester of Wheel of Sharp Weapons and then there was going to be a little break. I was going to get ordained. A lot of other people were going to get ordained and then we were going to continue on with the study program. I don't know, tenants or something. And so it was like a really interesting time to meet these teachings because I was in, right? I was invested. I like this path. Um, and yet, you know, there was sort of a not quite as much spiritual maturity. So when I met these teachings, I thought, okay, never again will I blah, blah, blah. Never again will I blah, blah, blah. Never again will I be the crow. Always and forever, I will be the peacock. I'm so inspired. Never again, never again. And, you know, and so uh, I, I had those thoughts. And so I'm approaching my ordination date as I'm listening to these verses, right? So imagine yourself like with the impending date, say you're gonna get ordained or you're gonna get married or you're gonna make some sort of big life decision and you're hearing these verses and it's getting closer and closer and closer. So I started thinking whenever I do something very samsaric, this is the last time I'm doing this. This is the last time I'm doing this samsaric activity. And this is the last time I'm doing that samsaric activity. And I started thinking this is the last time, the last time, the last time. And my cutoff date is going to be my ordination. Now, you know, most of you wouldn't be that foolish, you know, and I was, you know, 20 or something. But um, not to say people that are 20 aren't wise. It just wasn't a particularly wise 20-year-old myself. I was just kind of excited. <laughs> Yay, practice, right? Um, and so, of course, what happened was I set myself up for failure by saying, never again, this is the last time, never again, this is the last time. The inspiration was a childish inspiration that didn't have enough self-awareness to know that growth is incremental and that you take, you know, two steps forward and two steps back some days. So it was really interesting to see the way I misused this very precious teaching to make me overly motivated. And then I met the same teaching again, maybe three or four years later, it came back around in the cycle of teachings. And then I was thinking, okay, instead of thinking this is the last time I'm gonna do this samsaric activity, I'm gonna think the next time I'm about to do this samsaric activity, how can I do it in such a way that minimizes damage? So instead of thinking this is the last time, think the next time, right? Which is a lot more self-aware. So instead of thinking this is the last time I will engage in divisive speech, I say to myself, the next time I'm engaging in divisive speech, I'm going to, and I catch myself doing it, I'm going to consciously turn down the volume or I'm going to consciously remove uh, people's specific details or I'm going to consciously not reveal secrets or something I know I can stop myself from doing rather than this whole you know now I'm done forever and always just by being inspired I'm finished childishness right so you know there's versions of how this still can erupt in us even if we're not overestimating our abilities where we're thinking now that I've understood I'm finished. Yeah, when actually now that I've understood, I can begin. Now that I've understood I can begin is the thing we have to come to again and again. So it was useful to meet these teachings during that time, um, although I did not hear them with the right ears. You know, I, it was um, enthusiasm mixed with attachment and excitement. You know, so this is tricky with Dharma because it feels like you can't overestimate the Dharma because you can't overestimate the Dharma, but you can overestimate your relationship to the Dharma and your ability to practice the Dharma. That can be very much overestimated. So, you know, to think what I understand is my starting point. It's not my finished product. Don't hold yourself up to an impossible standard. It's very much like when you do the teachings on the four opponent powers and your Vajrasattva practice, when you're generating the power of resolve, you make a very practical 
time limited finite resolution of how much negativity you can refrain from in the future right you don't think i'm never gossiping again you think tomorrow until noon i'm not going to gossip because i'm not going to see anyone but you know you're like i'm you know you can make it something very finite and tangible and then you grow your strength and grow your strength and grow your strength does it make sense so hear it hear it this way yeah, hear it this way. And um, yeah, other other questions or ideas? I have something. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ah, I thought of sharing after, you know, you were talking about expectations and uh, keeping a bodhicitta, you know, in our mind at all times. And I found it um, easier in times of difficulty nowadays for instance, if I'm, you know, with low energies, depressed, uh, usually when I get a phone call from a friend who needs help, you know, in these situations, and I say, oh, I'm really not up to it. You know, I don't want to deal with it. And now, after practicing, I find that if I'm sincere and I notice it and I don't expect anything for myself, but I answer the call and I am able to help, it uplifts, you know, my energies as well. So I'm sincere. I know, you know, that uh, I'm not expecting anything for myself. And yet, helping someone else, even, you know, a tiny bit, makes me, you know, keep the path and go on. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point because um, expectation and motivation are not the same thing, but we mix them together sometimes. You know, if my motivation is bodhicitta, now I have an expectation that I will abide by everything bodhicitta and I will be the perfect bodhisattva just by having thought that. It puts an unfair pressure on yourself. But by motivating, you do lift yourself up to a higher standard and do live better. You know, mm -hmm. so it's, it's a bit delicate, isn't it? That how to make sure your motivation doesn't turn into an unfair or unrealistic expectation because it can very easily happen. But I think what you say is quite right that when you let go of that, you're much more effective and happier. <laughs> and happier. Mm -hmm. So then there's another question. Can you reflect please again on the emptiness of emptiness? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, the emptiness of emptiness? Well, everything is empty of inherent existence, including emptiness itself. Do with that what you will. <laughs> Do you want to ask a follow-up? Yeah, empty meaning empty of inherent existence, empty of being unitary, partless, independent, empty of being true, empty of inherence, yet not existing from its own side including the self, right? Yeah. So that's its own conversation, but um, it's important to keep in the back of your mind because remembering that will prevent a lot of trouble. The emptiness question, can you reflect again about self-grasping? So self-grasping ignorance is in this context, uh, viewing the I, the conventional I that does exist relatively, and superimposing or adding a sense of inherent existence, independence, etc., to it. And so it's grasping on a false idea of the I. And when you grasp onto that false idea of the I, then you very naturally have self-cherishing. Just very naturally on its heels is then I must protect this self because it seems unrelated to others, which is an illusion, isn't it? It's a complete illusion, but if that seems to be the case, then it seems to make sense to think of yourself primarily and of primary importance. So, yeah, it's interesting um, to see how, even if intellectually we understand, it's very easy to forget. Yeah. Okay, more verses? So, um, turning to verse 8, continuing with the Tonglen theme. All of our sufferings derive from our habits of selfish delusions we heed and act out, as we said before. Then it continues, as all of us share in this tragic misfortune, which stems from our narrow and self-centered ways, we must take all our sufferings and the miseries of others and smother our wishes of selfish concern. 
So we talked about the first sentence, but the sentence, second sentence, as all of us share in this tragic misfortune, all of us share in this tragic misfortune is a really key piece to giving other people a break. Yeah. So when, if you can think about how self-awareness is the key to all transformation, self-awareness is also the key to empathy. It seems counterintuitive, but the better you not know and understand yourself, the easier it is to understand other people. So if you see the way that you're driven by self-cherishing and you see the way it destroys your own peace and you see the way it keeps you trapped in this, you know, echo chamber of your own craziness, if you see that in yourself, then when you see it playing out in others, you can naturally have more patience with them. Yeah, you think, I know what it's like to be stuck in that space. I know that place that they're in. I don't like it. I don't want them to hurt me. They shouldn't be allowed to hurt me. I can still be assertive, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm not angry at them. Because it would be like being angry at a baby for having a tantrum. You know, when a baby's having a tantrum, especially if it's not your baby that you have to deal with all the time, if it's someone else's baby, right? And they're having a tantrum. You think, well, the poor thing. The poor thing is just overtired, or the poor thing just needs something to eat, or the poor thing just needs a cuddle, right? You don't think bad babies stop crying, even though crying isn't nice. Even though it's not nice to hear crying, you're not mad at the baby for crying. You know it's the nature of babies to cry, okay? And that it's symptomatic of a suffering. So similarly, when we're seeing the bad behavior of others, if we can immediately think, Bad behavior always comes from suffering. Suffering always comes from negative karma ripening. Negative karma always comes from negative actions of body, speech, and mind, which always come from ignorance. So there's no place to put anger unless it's on ignorance, which is shared, you know? So this, this verse is really significant because when it's saying, as all of us share in this tragic misfortune, all of us share in this tragic misfortune, which stems from our narrow and self-centered ways. Yeah, we must take all our sufferings and the miseries of others and smother our wishes of selfish concern. So to smother, you know, like to uh, rob the fire of air so that it dies is quite, you know, full on um, way to approach this, but we're saying we're smothering selfishness. We're not smothering the self or its basic needs. Yeah, we're, what we're saying is that your body is a human body of the desire realm. It needs to be fed and watered and sheltered. You need human affection and connection. You need meaningful work. These are fine. Don't worry about dealing with those. What we're saying is that all the extra stuff you place on top of that that says, I am necessary for your happiness is lying. Yeah. It is not necessary for your happiness. And even if you got it, it wouldn't be enough, right? Like if I just have one square of chocolate, then I will be happy and it will be enough. And then you have one square of chocolate and 90% of the time you think, actually, I need two. Actually, I need three. Oh, I don't feel good now. I'm going to need a coffee. You know, this is what we do. And so to realize that smothering selfishness is liberating you. Yeah, so don't feel like you need to like stamp on your needs or squash or suppress anything. Yeah, feel what you're feeling, but have enough objectivity with what you're feeling to check. Is it driving me towards a self-cherishing attitude or not? Yeah, is it kind of pushing my habituation towards somewhere that is destructive or not? That's the important place to check. So smother is a full on word and you know this text is really hardcore. Um, but if you think of selfishness as the main destroyer of your peace and the main harmer of others, then thinking to smother it is actually very functional. It's just easy to misunderstand. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is still related to Tonglen. So then verse nine says, should the impulse arise now to seek our own pleasure, we must turn it aside to please others instead. 
for even if loved ones should rise up against us, we must blame our self-interest and feel it's our due. Right, so this is very, very uh, easy to misunderstood as a martyrdom verse, right? Like many verses within the Bodhisattva path, it sounds like you're saying, no, no, no happiness for me. You take all the happiness, I'll be fine. You know, it, it, it really does sound like that. And what it's saying is the impulse, right? Do you see the first part? Should the impulse arise now to seek our own pleasure? This impulse that we're talking about is a self-cherishing impulse impulse. So it's not saying you're not allowed to have happiness. In fact, you, you, your birthright is happiness. Your nature is happiness, right? Your essential nature is a calm, contented place of joy that can be infinitely expanded until Buddhahood. So this isn't saying you're not allowed to have happiness. What it's saying is this impulse to seek our own pleasure, which is a completely different thing than wanting the permanent, unchanging, lasting happiness that's uncontaminated of a complete Buddha. Okay, so, so just kind of sit with, right, the impulse, the impulse to seek our own pleasure. You know, we have to kind of unpack these verses word by word, really sit with what's being said here. So what is that impulse that is craving and grasping, like we talked about with the 12 links, that impulse that is just hungry yeah, that one that just wants pleasure after pleasure after pleasure. Is that one functional or not? Does it ever get what it wants? Even when it, get what it, even when it gets what it wants, it doesn't get what it wants. Yeah, that's the one we need to really identify. Because if you can catch it in the moment, you're really doing fantastic practice. So don't think fantastic practice is it never arising. Fantastic practice is not indulging it. Yeah, so fantastic practice is really being able to catch yourself in the middle of a lie. And if you catch yourself in the middle of the lie, it loses power and falls apart. Yeah, it does. It loses power and it falls apart. So you notice this impulse that says, okay, I do need toilet paper at the supermarket. Okay, and so I know I only need this amount for my household, but I'm going to buy three times as much just in case there's none here tomorrow, just in case there's not enough for next week. So because of the just in case, I'm gonna get way more than I actually need because that feels like security, that feels like safety, and that feels like not confronting my old habits. So I'm gonna get more than I need. <laughs> that hungry mind that justifies, I'm going to take more than I need, often has an undercurrent of fear as well, yeah? an undercurrent of what will happen if, what will happen if, you'll figure it out, you're creative, it's fine. But self-cherishing says, no, 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 things must be the way you're used to. Otherwise, you can't be happy in the way that you're used to. When in fact, actually, you could be happier, changing some habits. Self-cherishing is lying to you and says, this impulse you feel to gather, crave, hoard, that is protection when it's not. Because of course, what is the immediate impact of when you're in these behaviors is that by taking more than you need, you're usually taking something of others, which is like the essence of self-cherishing, right? Thinking me first with indifference to others, even at the expense of others. And when you do things at the expense of others, do they like you, <laughs> right? Do they like you? Does it facilitate community harmony? Does it lead to a peaceful society? Does it make people feel calm if everyone's saying, sure, I hope you get some toilet paper, but I'm going to take way more than I need and just, you know, you're on your own. Good luck. Right. Does it make for a happy, peaceful society? What if we all ran out of toilet paper at exactly the same time? We would all come up with creative solutions and all sorts of funny jokes while we figured it out. Right. But, you know, self-cherishing says, I need to be the one that's safe. And I, you know, you guys, will, hopefully you'll be fine. I'm not mean or anything. Hopefully you'll be fine. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not stealing from you. But me first. Yeah, you know this mind? This impulse, right? This impulse that forgets that suffering is so much less when you're all in it together. Yeah, when you're really having the mind of connection. 
just like if we were the only ones experiencing this virus, you know, only our family was stuck at home, only our family was worried about finances, only our family was vulnerable to illness, it would be a much harder suffering. Yeah, but because your whole neighborhood is, then in a way your mood is lifted because of that. Even though it makes the crisis bigger, your personal experience of the crisis is less because of the feeling of connection. Do you agree? Because of the feeling of connection, your suffering is less than it would be if you were the only one. Yeah, a few yeses popping up in the chat. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. So, you know, just kind of sit with self-cherishing is a big liar. If you catch it in the lie, it gets embarrassed and runs away. If you catch it in the lie after the fact, you usually feel sad or mad or defensive. But if you can catch it in the moment, sometimes you can even really laugh yourself out of it and see how silly it is. Yeah. If you can catch it before, even better, of course. But sometimes catching yourself right in the middle of the old problem you've done a million times can be incredibly powerful. Right in the middle of it. Yeah. Watch it collapse. So we, we must turn it aside to please others instead. Look, this is the poetic rendering of these verses. Um, Alexander Berzin also has a literal rendering and there's a few other translation choices. But just, you know, think the idea of pleasing others we know is a bad idea, right? Pleasing others is not a great plan. Being of benefit to others by working on our spiritual path, two thumbs up. <laughs> Wanting to be a people pleaser is probably full of the eight worldly concerns. That's not what's being said here. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, there's an ask, can you show the book? Um, you know, I guess when you're thinking about pleasing others, you're also thinking about, can you put aside kind of the needs that you have that aren't that big a deal? Yeah. Um, are there things that your friends and family would prefer happen. And it's not your first preference, but you could go along with it and it wouldn't do you any harm. Might as well. It's just very delicate to make sure that you don't let that bubble into a resentment that's more than your current capability. So that line between when are you being assertive about your current state of mind and your preferences about things, and when have you become selfish and tight about them? Yeah, so, so this is very delicate because if we pretend to be better off than we are and act as if we're better off than we are, there's often a boiling resentment under the surface or a kind of a creeping sadness of feeling unrecognized and unfulfilled or various things can happen. So a very, you know, ordinary example, very ordinary example is um, the, the boys next door like to have long, loud parties and drink. Okay, the boys next door. Hi, boys next door. Um, that's what they like to do, especially on the weekends. And not every weekend, but sometimes that's what they like to do. So, of course, I'm very happy that they are enjoying one another and <laughs> connecting and having fun. And I'd like to go to bed at a reasonable hour. And I would rather there not be the sound of loud music, boys laughing, cigarette smoke, you know, all that kind of stuff. I would rather that not be the case, okay? Because I'm not a bodhisattva, because I'm not uh, completely perfect in any way. It gets to me after a while, yeah? And so self-cherishing would say, you need to go over there and tell them off right away when it starts, yeah? When, and when I'm more reasonable, I think, okay, if I had better mind training, it wouldn't bother me at all but it does bother me a little bit. So what's a fair thing to ask? What's a fair thing to ask? And so what I say to them is, if it goes over, you know, 11.30, 12 at night, can you please turn off the music and just talk? That's my preference. It's not my demand, it's my preference. Of course, my real preference would be if you stopped at nine, but I can cope with a few extra hours of noise. For the sake of your joy and your enjoyment of each other, I can not be a stick in the mud and let you have a few more hours than I would prefer. But to this point, I think societally we would all agree music could go off at 11.30 or 12 at night. That's a fair enough thing to ask. 
Okay, so don't get lost in the story because probably all of you all have your preferences about what's appropriate or not in this situation and all sorts of arguments for and against my solution. But my, my inner process is, what is a fair thing to express given what I know of societal norms, given what I know about my own ability to cope with stress? Yeah, because what do I have to offer sentient beings at my level is a degree of peace of mind and a degree of, you know, education and some skills. And none of those are going to be as functional if I'm tired. So I won't be able to offer what I offer to the world if I'm too tired. And so it's okay to say, I'd prefer you turn the music down. Now, if they don't, they don't, right? It's just a preference. I could call the police, I could retaliate, I could do a whole whatever thing. But often if you just say to people, I would prefer this, they go, oh, sure, right? Oh, sure, thanks for telling me, I didn't realize. Yeah. So being a, you know, pleasing others doesn't mean that you're enabling their bad behavior. It doesn't mean that you're not able to express your own preferences. It doesn't mean that. It just means you have this inner negotiation in your head of when am I being too self-centered and when am I just hitting the limit of my practice right now and I need some help from my fellow man to support me staying peaceful. And all I can do is ask, you know, if I demand and punish and retaliate, I might get what I want, but at what cost? Then there's a bad relationship between me and the neighbors and that's not what we want. You know, then there's a tension all the time, even when things are quiet, et cetera, et cetera. So think about your own life and your own examples and how you would maybe navigate this in such a way that is skillful, not self-cherishing, not indulging self-cherishing, right? But still acknowledging that you have self-cherishing. Do you understand what I mean? You're acknowledging the level that you have and you're seeing how much can you get over yourself? And then recognizing your own limits. It's delicate because if you lie to yourself, the same problem happens that it, then if you just indulged your self-cherishing. If you pretend not to help have self-cherishing and act to be the perfect bodhisattva, you'll just have these grudges internally and these sadnesses and these angers and then they'll come out in other ways. As you know, right? You're adults, you've lived your life, you've seen this go. So now we're gonna move into um, the ones talking about specific karmic cause and result. Yes, one comment is, it's not easy. We would all, <laughs> we would all agree with you. I think it is not easy. No, it's not. It's not easy, but um, hopefully it makes it easier to realize that you can be working on your self-cherishing while you have self-cherishing. That's the whole point. It's not like you suddenly have to be perfect while trying to practice perfection. It might sound self-evident, but I, I hear a lot of people get this confusion where they think they can't do Dharma practice unless they're already perfect at Dharma practice, or they can't call themselves a Buddhist unless they're already a Buddha. You know, it's a big misunderstanding that, that a lot of people have. The whole point is that you have a perfect, pure nature. Your mind is empty of inherent existence, which means all of the mess is removable. Don't identify with the mess. It's just a mess. Yeah. And one, uh, one addition, parents seem to extend their self-cherishing to take care of their children. Can you transform it to be only compassion? Yes. <laughs> yes, gradually, but um, it's very rare to find parents that do. Um, so sometimes you see some some parents who have um, worked on their self cherishing, and uh, they just have compassion for their children and not so much attachment self cherishing mess. But you know, think about what the eye does when you have grasping at an inherently existent self. If you have grasping at an inherently existent self me then naturally is mine yeah me and then mine so you kind of extend the circle of your grasping to include mine and for most parents their children become like possessions or extensions of i and so looking after them is like looking after themselves 
and it seems really compassionate and sometimes is very compassionate, but it's, it's kind of like they've just extended the radius of self-grasping to include other beings in that bubble, which is sort of okay to a point, but then if anyone threatens their child, it's like someone threatening one of your limbs, you know, rather than naturally trying to see both sides of the story, you always take your child's side. So yeah, gradually. So if you wind up with the people that you're looking after, it's, um, it's very easy to fall into that trap of just thinking of them as extensions of yourself in an egocentric way rather than in a selfless way. It becomes very egocentric and yet it might not seem like you're thinking about it the wrong way. You know, the other is myself, but you're grasping at the self. So that's just a problem too, isn't it? You know, my family, my neighborhood, my culture, my country just becomes extensions of self-grasping. So if you challenge any of those things, then you feel threat and then negative states of mind, harmful actions, etc. right? Yeah, it's important to look at. Yeah, it's a, I often think there's a, a particular political figure who will remain nameless that says, um, America first right? America first. And what has America first done to America's relationship with other countries? Harmed it, <laughs> right? So if you think my family first, my family first, what does that do with your relationship to other families? Harms it, right? And yet it seems like it's protection. It seems practical. It actually is very dysfunctional. Yeah, so we all have that tiny little political figure that says me first, mine first. Okay, karma, yay, karma is fun. Okay, so these are really, um, these are really full on you guys, but, but really interesting because not often is karma discussed so specifically. Um, when we look at the 10 non-virtues and their results, it talks about, you know, behavioral results and causally concordant results and environmental results. And you, you do see some specific results in terms of cause and effect. But um, this particular text goes into more detail than we normally see. So it's interesting because if you're experiencing the effect, you can immediately check, am I still creating the cause? So that's the way to hear it, okay? Don't hear it as more reasons why I'm bad, okay? Hear it as, let me check. If I'm experiencing this, do I still create the cause for it? Or am I just finishing old karma? Okay, so verse 10. When our bodies are aching and racked with great torment of dreadful diseases we cannot endure, this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning for full circle upon us, from wrongs we have done. Till now we have injured the bodies of others. Hereafter, let's take on what sickness is theirs. Okay, so basically if you're experiencing uh, dreadful diseases, <laughs> for example, right? If you're experiencing dreadful diseases, this is the wheel of sharp weapons from injuring the bodies of others. Okay, so if we're someone who happens to be experiencing this virus, we want to be asking ourselves, am I still harming or injuring the bodies of others, like animals, like insects, etc.? Am I still harming the bodies of others? Because this is the result of that. Does it make sense? So you just check and you think, all right, if I'm not doing that anymore, now I have a vow not to kill, now I'm really careful, okay. That means that this karma is finishing, it's exhausting, and I'm not creating any more of a similar type for the future. So let's take it on and give it back to the self-cherishing thought. It came from the self-cherishing thought, give it back to the self-cherishing thought. So I'm going to take this on as my path. To take it on means many different things, doesn't it? To take it on, what does that mean? One thing it means is that you're choosing to make it voluntary. Yeah, to take it on means that instead of resisting the struggles that are happening right now, and that resistance leading to further negative states of mind, you're deciding this is voluntarily what I'm bringing into my circle of experience. And from that place, I'm going to benefit others using this experience. So if that means, 
I don't know, my work needs to look different, if that means my communication style needs to be different, if that means I need to simplify my life, if I need to let go of certain things, so be it. This is now the material or the poison I'm using to transform into beauty. Yeah, so to take it on means that you're not letting it affect you in a negative way. You're not letting it affect you in a negative way. You're saying this negative experience is positive for me. Yeah, so do you understand? So on one level you're checking, am I still creating the cause for that? Yes or no, <laughs> practice accordingly. And now that it's here in my sphere of experience, I choose to bring it in to my path of awakening. How do I do that? This kind of like two tiered approach with each of these. Is it clear kind of how to approach it? Okay. So here's another classic for the modern era. Verse 11, depressed and forlorn when we feel mental anguish. This is the wheel of sharp weapons returning full circle upon us for wrongs we have done. Till now we have deeply disturbed the minds of others. Hereafter, let's take on this suffering ourselves. So to deeply disturb the minds of others. Of course, you know, we can't make anyone's mind do anything, but we can be a powerful condition. Yeah, we already are a powerful condition. So this isn't, um, you know, don't read it the wrong way. You can't give anyone a mood, but you can be a very strong condition. And do you disturb the minds of others? This is a really delicate one because in one sense, you don't want to tiptoe around people not wanting to upset them and you know kind of dancing around their delusions not wanting to activate them and then you become hyper vigilant and you become kind of neurotic you don't want to get like that right but also you don't want to be thinking everyone's mind is their own i take no responsibility for my impact on them you don't want to do that either right so what you're looking at is is my way of being if I was to look at myself from the outside, is it having a negative effect on other people? Yeah, is it having a negative effect on other people? To a degree to which I really need to do something about it, but any little bit, I'm trying. So it's a very useful thing to just kind of step out of yourself mentally and just kind of watch yourself from the outside like an observer, you know, be the observer to your own marriage be the observer to your own role within a community. Be the observer and just say, if I just met me, how would I come across? If I just met me, would I relieve stress or give stress? Yeah, Miri is saying, uh, I find it very difficult not to slip from taking on suffering to feel as if it's a punishment that I should endure. Yeah, because we have, um, Excuse me. <clears throat> it's the wheel of sharp weapons returning. I have to look up what coughing is from. Hold on. <laughs> but, yeah. Look, you, please don't see it as punishment, please. Yeah. Because then also you could, then you have to think everything is a reward and that's crazy, right? If you were to think, oh, look at my comfortable house. This is a reward. Look at my delicious food. This is a reward. That's creepy, right? You wouldn't do that. So then why are you thinking of your bad stuff as a punishment? Yeah. Uh, maybe you can catch your breath and maybe I can say something to Please, do Please, yes. I give workshops sometimes and then one day was like a group of doctors and um, so they said, well, as a Buddhist, don't you find it terrible that when you get sick, you have to ask, you know, you have to think that this is a punishment. So I said, well, you know, I don't understand why you get this idea, but anyway, and then I said, well, if I think of it as a punishment, I need somebody to punish me. I need a punisher. Whereas, as you just said, if I think of this as a consequence, then, you know, I, I have to take responsibility. And then he said, oh, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Because the thing is, if you do see it as a punishment, you have to believe in something that is that has the power to punish you. And karma itself cannot do that because it's not a being. So this is one way that one could kind of look at it also. Yeah, thanks for that. I think that um, that helps a lot, I think. Yeah, because 
then who is it that gets to do that? Who is it that has that power? <clears throat> calls into question our whole belief system, doesn't it? You know, and what is the creator? Does it make more sense for there to be a separate omniscient, omnipotent creator who's decided to make this crazy messy world full of crime and punishment and reward? Or does it make more sense to see cause and effect just the way we see it play out in the natural world? You know, does it make more sense for something to pop out of nowhere with no reason or a reason being from some d divine creator? Or does it make more sense for things to just be the natural unfolding of cause and effect? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah, punishment is a, it's an easy way to misunderstand these. And when you're reading these, try to have like an inner chuckle right? Try to kind of laugh at yourself and go, right, that's why. <sighs> right, that's why. And just kind of, you know, laugh at yourself a little bit, because a lot of this is very what you would assume it to be. You know, the correlation between cause and effect is quite straightforward. They have to be of a similar type, don't they? And so you go, right, all right. You know, I think sometimes, um, when I read um, this one, depressed and forlorn with mental anguish, you know, I used to have quite terrible depression when I was a teenager, just epic depression, clinical depression, medicated, everything went through the whole thing. And, um, and I remember when I was really depressed, always looking for something to blame that was, you know, outside of my own mental habits. You know, it's genetics, it's chemicals, it's my family of origin, it's this, it's that, it's this and that all of which are totally conditions. Sure, they're conditions. I don't have to pretend there are no conditions, but my way of thinking was making me miserable. And so I could think, oh, therefore I'm even worse. I'm making myself so sad. I'm a terrible person, you know, whip myself for making myself sad. But because I was going to Dharma classes at that time, I thought, oh, what a relief. I'm making myself sad. Oh, what a relief. Here I thought it was all these factors out of my control. If it's within my control, sure, it's gonna take a while, but I can do something about it if it's under my control. Yeah, and you know, it takes time and it's not like, um, like magically you become an undepressed person, right? Even now there's the habit of depressive thinking, but it comes up, I see it, it's my old friend, I recognize it and it dissolves. So the tendency remains, right? It's not like, oh, I'm all better now. No, but it's like a thought that might have come up and taken over a whole day, week, month, year, 20 years ago, now comes up, I see it, it dissolves and goes. And so I have like a bad five minutes, you know? It's a bad five minutes, we can cope with a bad five minutes. It's way better than a bad five years, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting to look at this. And now when you read these verses, you think, oh, right, I've disturbed the minds of others. Okay, do I, still, especially do I still intentionally, even more importantly, yeah. Hey, I have a question. <clears throat> In a way, um, I'll put it a little bit bluntly for the question, but the karma is a huge computer or calculator that doesn't lose anything. So don't we uh, change God with the power of karma, though it has different characteristics, but we can't run away from it. It comes from, a, from life to life. Uh, we don't know how it, it acts, uh, not us uh, simple people. There are people who, who understand. So, Okay, it is not vicious. Uh, we have the power to change things, but but there is I don't know what it is huge wisdom, huge memory uh, that we are acted upon and we act within. And yeah. Um... I guess the question is, is there a benefit in thinking that way or a disadvantage in thinking that way? Or it's just kind of a, are we exchanging one framework for another that's actually quite similar? Um, yeah, there's a lot to unpack in your statement. Um, yeah, what, why, why do you think you're asking that? Is it worrying you? 
want to see the benefit. I, I see the benefit that there, I have much more power in my, in my hands, my responsibility. Uh, I'm not afraid of punishment. I'm not afraid of some power that will do things without uh, me, I don't know what, not being able to do anything. But if we look upon the universe, upon the cosmos, and we don't take a Christian or Jewish religions uh, in the lower way, okay, of kissing uh, the door or... So there is a huge power that we really don't understand and all religions try to approach it. Uh, and morality is the key and compassion this is this is my uh, this is what i'm thinking about okay about uh, uh, okay the benefits of this system but the common common uh, philosophy or understanding of the cosmos that is universal human i don't know what this is my motivation for asking the question well uh yeah, it's, I think, you know, we're, we're with you and we always mix, you know, how we were brought up to what we meet and there are some universal truths about ethics, but I think that the reasons for our ethics, even if they're the same ethics and the same conclusion, the way we get there is quite different in Buddhism, not just because of karma, but because of emptiness, right? So I think the, the very, the big difference is the way we see that cause and effect and emptiness are complementary and not contradictory. This is a really profound point because individually they're interesting ideas, but try to hold them together in one thought and it becomes absolutely profound. <clears throat> so you think on one hand, positive constructive actions lead to happiness. Negative destructive actions lead to suffering. Sure, and nothing exists from its own side inherently including positive actions and negative actions. And yet that does not undermine this, right? It's fascinating, it's profound. And that razor's edge is what's different in Buddhism, that razor's edge. So if we can try and live there, I think it's much less likely for us to over-personalize our individual experience. We're the individual experiencing it, but it's not the same as having ownership or attributing, you know, benefit or blame. Yeah. So then you start to see the relative existence is more like an interconnected network. And, you know, each part of the net has a hub where there's many things coming together. And we're sort of loosely speaking in charge of that one intersection of the network. But to say that the intersection of the network has ownership of it doesn't make sense. You could kind of loosely call it a name and say, you know, the north part or the west part of the network, but you know, that's only relative to the whole rest of the network. You know, and so that's that's interesting. So then what harms this part ripples through and harms this part and comes back around and harms itself. Yeah. It's quite interesting. So it's just, you know, the natural rippling of energy, yeah, not someone um individually directing it yeah yeah it's it's very interesting so we'll just we'll just kind of sit with it and have a little break And then having landed on the conclusion that cherishing others, bodhicitta, is still your motivation, is even more your motivation. Go through the actions of that by shifting to Tonglen, giving and taking. On the in-breath, breathing in the suffering and difficulties of yourself and others in the form of black smoke. 
Give it to your self-cherishing thought. Clouds form, lightning strikes, and the shell of self-cherishing covering your heart cracks open, your heart released. And breathing out all of your happiness, your roots of virtue, your merit, sending it out on the out breath, giving to all. Breathing in black smoke, breathing out golden light. Breathing in, taking suffering, breathing out, giving happiness. Each cycle of breath wearing down the self-cherishing more and more, releasing and expanding the heart of bodhicitta more and more. And with a few more in-breaths, feel that self-cherishing has been subdued and cherishing others has been expanded. And the golden light of your happiness that you've been sending out continues to radiate out while at the same time you become continuously filled by it a wellspring that never ends. And let go of the visualization and come back to your motivation of bodhicitta May I continue along the path to enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. And relaxing your attention. Okay, so any, um, any thoughts coming up? Uh, yes. Hmm. Um, I was asking myself if I've ever done something with a bodhicitta motivation. And lately I've been doing this job of being a teacher assistant. So I noticed that I'm not, if, if I'm helping the students and I managed it, then it's fine. But if I can't really help them, if I don't solve the problem, then something in my self-cherishing becomes puffed up and I'm becoming like this, oh, I'm not a good teacher assistant. I'm not like, and it, Usually it never comes up, but when I'm trying to do something with Bodhicitta and with a good motivation, it doesn't work. Then, and also when it does work, then self-cherishing, like it's, it's funny because when I'm not doing something that I'm trying to do with a Bodhicitta motivation, then the self-cherishing doesn't arise. But when I'm trying to do something with Bodhicitta motivation, then the self-cherishing does arise. So, 
So I'm, con I'm confused in, on how to balance it and how to stop focusing about me. Yeah, I, I think what you're describing is a really, um, really common thing to happen, actually. Um, but it, it's not something that we talk about very often. Um, so it's good that you brought it up because it's, it's sometimes like we, if we're kind of riding the wave of old habits before we met the Dharma, we were generally nice people, you know, we're nice, polite people who sometimes got grumpy and did the wrong thing, but we're nice enough people. And so sometimes if we're just without an agenda, just going about our life, we're very effective, nice people who are helpful. Yeah. And now we're organizing our helpfulness and we're organizing our motivation and kind of getting our head around it and making it much more powerful. But by doing that, it's, it also kind of um, can make us self-conscious. You know, before it was just natural. We were just helping people because that's what we do. We didn't need to stop and think about it. We were just helping people, you know, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't, but that was just what we were about. It didn't need to be thought about too much. But now that we think about it, it triggers some self-consciousness and kind of stifles a little bit of that like spontaneity or stifles a little bit of that um, ease and flow. So it's something that, that I think is quite common that when you start trying to organize your thoughts, um, it actually can kind of interrupt the flow a little bit. And yet we still need to do it, the organizing the thoughts and saying, in order to be of benefit to all sentient beings, I'm going to do my ordinary job, but with an extraordinary motivation that I'm not going to tell them and they're not going to know about, but I'm doing it with this big motivation, my normal life. Um, but by doing that, um, the ego wants to say, are you really, did that really help? You know, <laughs> and it's kind of like, hmm, you think you're so smart, you know, and um, it, it's really interesting what happens. So if you can just kind of notice that that does happen and remember that one mental moment, if you were to like snap your fingers and divide it into 64, 65, that's how quickly our mind changes, yeah? What, like one sixty-fourth of a finger snap, one, one thought moment to another, that's how quickly the mind changes. So you go from setting your motivation to keeping your motivation, keeping your motivation, losing your motivation, losing motivation. Old habits coming up, new habits coming in, and it's all so quick. And you don't even notice the shifts in your motivation or the shifts in how you're viewing your work, unless you're very, very mindful. And it's hard to be very, very mindful while also trying to do another job. You know, you're trying to do your actual job, explain this, show this, help this, whatever that, and remain vigilant of your motivation. It's, it's hard. We don't have that mental power. So instead of um, trying to squeeze yourself into a hypervigilance that isn't possible or useful, try to think of your motivation as like the launch sequence. You know, the, the five, four, three, two, one, before the rocket blasts off. Think of your motivation as like the, the launch sequence where you're, you're, before you start, it's like, right, the purpose of my life is to understand and undermine suffering, is to understand and develop happiness. That's the purpose of my life. And mainly right now, I'm my own guinea pig. So let's just work on negative states of mind and develop positive states of mind where and when I can, enlightenment, enlightenment. You know, and you have a chat with yourself like that conversationally. You know, you can use a prayer, you can use a word, you can use a mantra, but sometimes if you just have like a conversation with yourself in your own words, it creates a vividness and a life to it that's genuine to the moment. Yeah, so today in this moment, I'm talking to myself this way to get me back clicked in, yeah, to that motivation. And then now that I'm launched, I'm gonna let it go and I'm not gonna be hyper about everything. I'm just gonna watch what I say and try and keep it harmonious and skillful. I'm just gonna watch what I say, but not worry too much about everything else because I've launched it well with a good motivation. Does that make sense? So then at the end of it, it's like you were either effective or you weren't, you were helpful or you weren't, but the main point was that you were trying to stay in alignment with having a positive body speech in mind and that, was accomplished <laughs> and that was the main thing anyway. The details of your work were sort of incidental um, and it's nice when it works out but if it doesn't oh well that wasn't the main thing anyway. 
Yeah, but I think what you're describing is quite normal, is that when you're thinking about it, you're worse at it. And when you're not thinking about it, you're better at it. And it seems really counterintuitive, but um, it's just remembering that the mind changes so quickly and that the ego will co-opt the spiritual path. And so once it's co-opted the spiritual path, even if you're saying the words of bodhicitta, you're not in the mind of bodhicitta or the mental factors of bodhicitta. It's clicked out. Yeah. So yeah, if you can just keep that, that little point that we've come to today, that motivation and expectations are not the same thing. My motivation and my expectation are not the same thing. Yeah. I can have a motivation of bodhicitta, and that doesn't mean I have an expectation of performance as a bodhisattva. I'm not going to expect myself to perform, you know, all the bodhisattva deeds. Does that make sense? All right, so I thought we would jump um, to verse 46. So verse 46 is on page 15. So this is kind of your summary of the day. And it says, in short then, whenever unfortunate sufferings we haven't desired crash upon us like thunder, this is the same as the smith who has taken his life with a sword he had fashioned himself. Our sufferings, the wheel of sharp weapons returning full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Hereafter, let's always have care and awareness never to act in non-virtuous ways. So how to use this information in your daily life? Let's have care and awareness, right? Let's have care and awareness, simple, simple, yeah. And um, then verse 49, jumping down, it says, as it's true what I've said about self-centered interest, I recognize clearly my enemy now. I recognize clearly the bandit who plunders, the liar who lures by pretending he's part of me. Oh, what relief I've conquered this doubt. Yeah. So this could be, um, you know, your morning motivation or your evening motivation quite easily. Um, you know, I recognize clearly my enemy now. I recognize clearly my enemy now. This bandit who plunders, right? The thief who like digs and gets all the treasures, right? Or this liar who lures by pretending. What a relief that I've conquered this doubt. Yeah, this doubt that self-cherishing is the self. Self-cherishing is not the self, right? It's a symptom of self-grasping ignorance. It's the slave of self-grasping ignorance, but it's not you. So to call it an enemy frees you. And so Yamantaka, spin round with great power, the wheel of sharp weapons of good actions now. Three times turn it round in your wrathful-like aspect, your legs set apart for the two grades of truth with your eyes blazing open for wisdom and means. Bearing your fangs of the four great opponents, devour the foe, our cruel selfish concern. With your powerful mantra of cherishing others, demolish this enemy lurking within. So here's again talking about Yamantaka, really the ultimate Yamantaka, um, the wisdom realizing emptiness combined with method and bearing your fangs of the four great opponents, this is your four opponent powers that you know from purification practice. So it's, you know, there's twofold, isn't it? If you want to purify negative states of mind, remember emptiness and apply the four opponent powers, either or, both, ideally, but that's how we're gonna really cut these patterns, yeah? And so with your powerful mantra of cherishing others, um, this can refer to any number of mantras. Um, we could talk about Omarapatsanadi, the um, Manjushri mantra, or we could talk about Yamantaka's mantra or Om Mani Peme Hum. But basically, we're, we're talking about something that protects the mind. Yeah, mantra means that which protects the mind. And so if we can just kind of keep, keep that in mind, that what protects the mind is bodhicitta, what protects the mind is the wisdom realizing emptiness, but self-cherishing says it's protecting us. Yeah, and that's the problem. That's the problem is we believe in the wrong protector. Okay. So it's, um, it's a big day of content and, um, and so we can wind it up if you'd like. Um, if you have any remaining questions, we can talk about them.
So there's one question that says, in case of suffering, one can also think that it's not only the result of his or her negative previous deeds, but it's a result of collective karma. This war or crisis or epidemic isn't only my fault, it's the result of so many causes and conditions starting from the Big Bang, what do you think? Um, mostly, um, there's not just one Big Bang, right? There's many Big Bangs, that there's beginningless time. Um, then in terms of collective karma, there probably better is to call it like shared karma or karma in common. So if everyone is experiencing similar things, um, we've all created similar causes. So we've all created the cause for this virus going around the world, but we're all individually also experiencing it differently. Right? So there's some things that we've done similarly, which is why we're having similar effects and live in a similar environment. But it's not quite the same as like, sometimes it can sound if you say collective karma, like everything's merging together to create something new or like the ether idea from Jung or some sort of collective consciousness, which is not Buddhist ideas at all. So we have karma that's, that's similar um, to each other, which is why we're all experiencing similar things simultaneously. Um, and then we're all having an individual experience of it. Yeah. But yeah, nobody's fault is a very good point. So, so it's normal and colloquial to say I'm experiencing this, it's my fault, but don't use the word fault if you can, because it immediately becomes like egocentric punishing I'm bad. It's not your fault. It's your responsibility, because it landed here through many causes and effects. It's not your fault. It's just your responsibility, because it landed here. Yeah, so take those ideas away. Because similarly, if you think it's my fault, then everything that good happens to you, you have to think, this is my reward, right? <laughs> That's silly. Yeah, so like this, okay. So um, if there are no more questions, we can um, uh, dedicate. Okay, so um, we'll do the um, Shantideva prayer together. So all together, just think that all of the energy we put into this day, May it go towards these ends. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient things remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the misery of the world. Thanks guys.